You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club, a home for those interested in international trade, shipping, procurement, logistics, and air freight. In fact, all things supply chain in the Americas, Asia, and beyond. This podcast is brought to you by your host, Mike King, and produced in partnership with Demurco Express Group, a global 3PL that specializes in managing logistics to, from, and within the Asia Pacific region. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Freight Buyers Club, which, as you've just heard, is produced with the support of Domenico Express Group. I'm Mike King, and you can find this episode and many more on all podcast platforms and on YouTube, along with a bunch of shorter video interviews and news insights. Please follow, download, and like if indeed you do like this podcast and supporting videos. It really does help us provide access to some of the best thought leaders and insights on shipping and logistics for free. You can also find all this content on www.thefreightbuyersclub.com where you can subscribe to receive every episode direct to your inbox. Now let's get started. You probably don't need me to tell you that uncertainty and risk haunt supply chains right now, just as much as they shadow global politics and economics. In fact, it's easy to argue that the future of trade and the often deadly musical chairs of international relations have not been tethered this tightly since the Cold War, maybe even the Second World War. From Guyana to Central Asia, the Middle East to the South China Sea and Black Sea, conflict or the threat of conflict threaten supply chain resilience, creating new strategic cost versus reliability sourcing and shipping equation for all concerned. And we also have a different type of risk in 2024 in the shape of billions of people heading to the polls, not least in the US where trade policy is about as high profile as it possibly could be ahead of elections later this year. But what does this mean in practical terms for freight markets, for the shippers that rely on international supply chains? And for those in the business of making trade happen, both now and more long term, well, to discuss these things, we have two fantastic experts who come at these topics from very different vantage points. And I'm sure most of you listening know them both. First up, we have the man who has led the Air Forwarders Association for pushing two decades, representing US air freight forwarders with aplomb around the world and on Capitol Hill. Brandon Freed, Executive Director of the Air Forwarders Association, Welcome back to the Freight Buyers Club. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here and thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Uh, And next up is a shipping expert whose experience spans the continents and includes senior roles in container shipping, the world of NVOCCs, as well as 3PLs. He currently represents a number of Asian-based logistics companies and he recently launched a very clever SaaS system platform, which allows factories to book online against their orders. Of course, it's the president of the company that carries his name, John Munro Consulting. John, welcome to the Freight Buyers Club. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks for having me. John, to you first, if I may, I want to come up to some of the macro trends I mentioned a bit earlier, a little bit later in this podcast, but let's first see where we are now in terms of freight markets. You were uh, starring on the podium at TPM24 in Long Beach at the start of March. It is, of course, a bit of a meeting place for all those negotiating long-term trans-Pacific shipping contracts. What was the general sentiment in California? Was it everyone talking about price? Was it about transit times? Was it about the environmental impact of Cape diversions around Africa to avoid the Suez Canal? Were all these factors in the discussions? What was going on? Well, I mean, certainly, Mike, all of those factors were discussed. I mean, you know, we, we entered TPM at a time that the likes of which we've never seen where we've got two wars, two canals blocked. We've got the ILA negotiations up. And so everybody's looking at this. And quite frankly, it's pretty impressive that nobody's nervous. Nobody's that concerned. Everybody seems to be taking it in stride. And, and everybody I talk to, BCOs and NBOCCs alike, have just accounted for the extra times by allowing for extra transit. So, so far, it, it looks good for the first half of the year. No rates... I mean, a few rates have, have sort of come out. It looks like things are going to be somewhere between 1,600 and 2,200. It's hard to say where they're going to fall. Uh, I don't think any of the big guys had really, at least that we'd heard and that I'd heard from, from others, had really inked anything with the carriers yet. And so what that means is the way the negotiations work, first you secure the big box retailers or, or Amazons, and then it all trickles down you know, to the medium-sized BCOs and then to the large NVOs and medium-sized NVOs and so on. So so basically, 
we look at this as sort of the kickoff of the negotiations, and we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. It sounds like it's a bit of an impasse between shippers and carriers from the people I spoke to about where and when you might want to tie those rates. I mean, obviously, spot rates on most trades have softened since Lunar New Year, factory shutdowns, which I guess is playing into the hands of freight buyers, although I'm guessing carriers were arguing demand's going to pick up in Q2, Q3. Well, actually, it's a little bit the opposite. They're expecting a good first half. What you have to take into account, the surge that we had in January, it's, it's uncertain if that was just shipping early. We have to keep in mind that the Lunar New Year this year is in February, so that's hitting the February since factories closed for about three weeks. Uh, last year, it was in January. So if you measure January over January, of course, you're going to get an increase. Until we get to the first quarter of the year, but most people are expecting the first half to be pretty good. And on the phone with China last night, everything's picking up. And, and I think that makes sense because if, if you look at down the line, the ILA negotiations, you know, they're up in the contract expires in September. Everybody, for a number of reasons, needs to ship early. They need to account for the longer transits. They need to make sure they avoid, if you're on the East Coast, the ILA negotiations. And then again, a few other things that I'll talk about later that are more political. Okay, let's come back to those. As you say, the Chinese Lunar New Year, it's changed. I think we probably won't get a, a real feel for what exactly happened in January, February until we maybe get first quarter figures. That will be true also in the air freight market. Brandon, rates were a bit up and down in February. A few more ups in, in March so far. Is this a Lunar New Year boost? Is it the Red Sea effect? Is it Sheen and Temu as the Financial Times is reporting boosting all the markets? What's going on? Yeah, it's a mixed bag. At this point, you know, when I talk to our members, it's a variety of factors. There's uh, obviously you, you have the the post Lunar New Year that could be an issue, and and of course the ongoing Red Sea conflict that's playing into it as well. And then you know there's tight capacity. You have at this point in time belly hole capacity on the air freight side has been lacking. We're seventy nine percent down prior to the pandemic. The airlines just haven't uh, st resumed uh, China service at the level at which we were hoping. That taxes the freighter market. That increased the rates as a result. There's 650 freighters out there. I think Michael Steen said yesterday in Hong Kong at the World Cargo Symposium that of those 650 uh, currently actively in the market, 100 of them are about to be phased out due to time constraints and aid, they're going to age out. So, you know, these are... These are all issues that are obviously having an impact on rates. Yeah, very interesting. That's uh, Michael Steen at Atlas Air, of course, CEO. Um, more generally, Brandon, are air freight forwarders, your members, are they expecting a good year or are, are we back to seasonality? How do you view demand or that supply demand balance? And I'll come back to that Trans-Pacific trade specifically a little bit later, because as you say, the mix between passenger and freighters is specific to that trade, isn't it? But in just in general, what's the sentiment? Well, they're cautiously optimistic. We knew that we could not sustain the lofty pandemic volumes. So we're obviously, we're normalizing in, in terms of the flows, but it's a, it's a delicate balance. And we all know that market conditions can change rapidly. As John mentioned earlier, we have numerous geopolitical influencers right now, any one of which can go sideways at any time, and that could have a dramatic impact on the market. Just for our listeners, Brandon, can you explain how the loss of airspace is affecting air cargo markets? I mean, we're mainly talking Russia has closed its airspace to Western carriers. What sort of effects that having? Yeah. So, you know, obviously if the Western carriers can't overfly Russian airspace, that's increasing the fuel they have to bring on board. That obviously uh, curtails the amount of cargo that they can haul. They want to haul passengers. You know, you got to remember the belly hold carriers are in business to haul, fly passengers. Generally speaking, cargo is an ancillary product for them. So, you know, if they have more fuel on board, they're going to order the cargo off the aircraft. So that's having an impact as well. But, you know, we, we're seeing with the Red Sea situation, there are vessels that are going around the Horn of Africa to circumvent that area. And then there are shippers that say, no, we're going to fly the cargo instead. It's a smaller percentage, but the reality is, is that that creates more demand, driving rates up in response. And there's obviously, there's a few people using sea air options as well. Yeah, we're seeing that in Mexico. We're seeing it in a lot of places where the boats come in and it's transferred to air cargo. One of the 
standouts in terms of the recovery from COVID, separate from the closure of Russian airspace, is this lack of take-up, I don't know what would be the right phrase for it, on the US and China route in terms of passenger services, which has led to this reliance on freighters that you reference. That's vastly reducing options for US shippers, right? Yeah, it is. And, you know, you talk to the airlines, they're slowly but surely ramping up service again. And I was on the phone last night with a member. I said, what do you think is causing this? Why are these U.S. carriers reluctant to resume operations to the extent that they had prior to the pandemic? And a lot of them point to China's uh, COVID policies, you know, where they were basically, they were locking down cities. And, you know, there are a lot of U.S. tourists that are just concerned about arriving in China and being a COVID outbreak and them locking down the city and them getting stuck there. And so obviously that's probably having an impact. It's probably not the only influencer. So U.S. carriers are reluctant to resume as much as they had in terms of service. And they're looking at other routes there and they're going into to other places, especially into Latin South America. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to resume service shortly. But for the time being, freighters seem to be a, an area of focus. Yeah, it really stands out because that passenger belly hole capacity has come back on most other routes. Uh, I've speaking to, off the record to various executives, they've quite often said to me that they're a little bit reluctant to visit China compared to previously. And it's not just COVID. They've got executive concerns about, you know, privacy sometimes, or even just the time taken to get a visa. Now, I know the other person on this call, John Munro, has no issues with any of this. He's back and forth all the time. John, you you, you know, see no issues going back to China, right? It's it's totally fine. Well, yeah, I, I just came back two weeks ago, just before TPM. I was, I was there for three weeks. Uh, I'm probably in a little bit different situation. I have a home there, and, and of course, my wife's family's there. She's from Shanghai, but we've been going back and forth three months out of the year. COVID really hit us hard, and and I think part of the issue that has has happened is this tete a tete between the U.S. and China, and She's ramping down regulations in terms of what he views as spying tactics and things like this. And the rate of U.S. companies has had a lot of companies rethink how many expats they want there. And, you know, I was there for two months last year and, and I'll be back there in, in another two months. But the one thing I noticed on the plane over and on the plane back is I was one of few foreigners there. And uh, you don't see a lot of Western expats the way you used to. And so that has changed the dynamics of the environment a bit. And I think we're still up in the air as to how that's going to sort out, depending upon possibly how the elections sort out. Yeah, definitely the candidates seem to be anti-China. And that's obviously now, now Capitol Hill is with the vote on TikTok and what we're seeing now with the ocean cranes, the terminal cranes, that, that big discussion now. They're very leery of China. But, you know, this is not abnormal nor unusual behavior with China. We've had this for a long time. I've traveled through China myself and, you know, that you, you just came to realize you're not going to get Gmail. You're not going to be able to use YouTube. This is what China's behavior has been for a long time. And now I think that the rhetoric that we're seeing out of Washington and Beijing is coming to a head. Yeah, unfortunately. As you mentioned there, guys, this political rhetoric about this U.S.-China standoff, it, it seems to be focusing in as the election gets closer on tariffs. Obviously, the Trump presidency ramped tariffs up on U.S. imports from China, and they've largely been kept in place by President Biden. I'm not really expecting you to get too political here, but just on a practical level, Trump has said, should he be elected again later this year, it, the inauguration would be in January next year, that he would impose tariffs of 60% or higher on Chinese goods as well as a blanket 10% tariff on all U.S. imports in his potential second term with a view to stimulating U.S. domestic production. How disruptive would this be to global trade, do you think? Brandon, do you want to go first here? I think it'd be very disruptive to global trade. I mean, you know, obviously, look, we're in a global society now. We depend on one another for trade all the time. You go into a Walmart, most of those products are not made in the United States. And, and I guess I'm selfish. I'm sure John is too. We're in the business of moving boxes and we move them between countries. Our members do it. And obviously when you install these protectionist measures, they have maybe good positive short-term effects, but in the long term, they're injurious to the countries. It's going to cost more to buy products. It's going to increase wages. It's just a zero sum game. 
and it never works. So from our perspective at the Air Forwarders Association, at this point, we're, we're not in favor of them. John, thoughts? I agree with Brandon. I mean, I think it's going to put a squeeze on the middle class. Things are going to be more expensive. Interest rates have been up. What I would say, though, is, you know, our globalization is what I call a fractional globalization. And, and that is to say that we've got these alliances, these trade alliances that have been built up since probably in the last one to two years with China lined on one side with, with their BRICS um, uh, trade agreements and the U.S. lined up on another. Yet we still manage to trade with China. And I would say if you look at the volumes, they're still substantial. At TPM, the rumor is everybody's preparing for a Trump win uh, in terms of what they're doing. And I think that's a part of what could be driving the first half to be fairly strong. It remains to be seen until we get through probably the rest of this month. But uh, I think everybody's preparing for that. I think we're a very resilient country, but it's definitely going to impact the trade flows. And we're seeing a little bit of a change in the way the carriers are looking at it. Some of them are starting to go to hub and spoke system. That's what Maersk is doing with the Hapic Lloyd agreements that they're coming up with. And I think you're going to see more of that because all the carriers have built these mega ships that really depend upon, you know, being filled with the Chinese mega ports. And as things shift, and they are shifting, whether it be Mexico or Vietnam, and it's no secret that Mexico is our largest trading partner, but now China's Mexico's largest trading partner um, in terms of the import of containers. We'll see more coming in domestically. Uh, so what does that mean for ships coming into LA, Long Beach, or Savannah, New York? That's right now, that's going to be a mix, but I think it's going to be a change in the way the carriers put together their ro port rotations, and it will make things more expensive. So container lines may have bought the wrong ships then, if we were talking about a more regionalized trade, possibly. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been saying for more than a year that the ships are too big. And what woke me up is I'm, is I'm standing in the ITS terminal with Transfer, about to unload my first ship. And I've got, I, I think it was a 12,000 TU MSC vessel on the right and a 9,000 O&E vessel on the left. And nobody could find the containers because they were all over the place. And, and then you look at the Ever Given you look at what's happened with the Panama Canal. I mean, it's 35 to million gallons every ship that has to go through there of fresh water. And they built that set of locks, and that's sucking up a lot more fresh water with the Neo Panamax vessels. So I, I think that, yeah, 24,000, 18,000 TUs will be tough to fill at one or two ports if this shift continues, and I think it will. And these ports have made significant investments, right? I mean, they've been dredging their capacity so, you know, to accommodate these things. It's, uh, it's quite an investment. I don't think anybody's really looking at this. I think everybody just assumes it's going to continue business as usual. But I, I predict that the ports will end up with issues uh, and the carriers will as well. And uh, maybe the air freighters as well. We've got the wrong planes. <laughs> <laughs> well... You know, I think that, that freighters will always be around, but the reality is, is that, uh, you know, they're still building them big. Although it's interesting, to John's point, when you look at the air freight market domestically in the United States, it started out when the wide body planes came online, they were flying wide bodies all over the U.S. And now it's very difficult to find a wide body flown internally within the, the U.S. They're all in oceanic routes. So it's a retrenching. And if you had a crystal ball out 30, 40 years ago, you would have thought that the wide body aircraft would be the mainstay of U.S. domestic travel. It's not the case. It's all narrow body now. Yeah. So shorter supply chains might mean more narrow bodied. Yeah. They could go back to smaller ships just for the flexibility. We'll just take a short break. We'll be back with you in a second. This podcast is proudly produced in partnership with DeMurco Express Group, a trusted provider of global shipping and contract logistics services in Asia, Europe, and North America. DeMurco's particular strength is in Asia, where it gives shippers the freight capacity and local market expertise to streamline freight movements to and from the region, particularly for trans-Pacific lanes. With 130 forwarding and logistics locations across China, India, and Southeast Asia, DeMurco connects Asia with the world like no other global 3PL. You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club. Okay, John, I'll just come back to you because I just want to clarify a couple of points you said there. So did you say we're having an early peak season because apart from, and, and I'll list these things yet again, apart from low water on the Panama Canal, problems at Suez, and the threat of legal action on the East Coast. So all of these things are very disruptive. People are already shipping as well. 
because of the possible implementation of a new tariff regime? Well, I, I don't know if it's call it an early peak season. Certainly, everybody's moved, I believe, their shipping schedules up. And I think that the movement of the Lunar New Year to February from January has impacted that. The question is, is how strong is demand? And you know that remains to be seen. We, we had a bang up Christmas holiday. I mean, demand was strong. It allowed uh, the consumer spending was up quite a bit. Uh, the volumes were up quite a bit. But we still had a surge coming into January, and we're not certain what the reason for that surge is. But I think that will continue the first half. If we're lucky and people continue spending, then we will have a bit of a peak season in the second half. Because that surge is basically because the consumer is extremely confident right now. They want to spend. Now, they're financing their buying sprees and, on, with credit cards, which isn't so great. But the reality is, is that we're not seeing a, a drop in consumer demand. I think the real telling tale was when Jamie Dimon and Ray Dalio came back and apologized for, uh, for expecting a recession. And when you see somebody like that back off on it, I mean, obviously, you know a lot of things that we don't. I'm expecting a pretty strong year. Yeah, me too. Brandon, so could Air Cargo get a turn of year boost if we have this new tariff regime? I think so. Well, it's usually it's the election in the United States is in November. and We inaugurate the president the following January. So in 2024, we're not going to see an increase in tariffs uh, unless the Biden administration has a change of heart. Uh, and if Trump is elected, that's that's an if because he might have other things distracting him. Uh, it, but the reality is, is that, you know, we'll see something in, in 2025 and the impact will be then. But for 2024, we're bullish. We're cautiously optimistic, as I said earlier, but generally speaking, we're bullish. I mean, th this could happen quite quickly because the president has got the powers under to, to use Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act mm -hmm. of 1962. So it, it would be wise to plan ahead then, Brandon. Yeah, I, I think that there's a possibility that if you know, the Trump presidency, he will come through on his promise. And we will see increased tariffs, and uh, we better brace for it. I was going to say, which means the second half could be strong as people anticipate that. Yep. And hold more inventory, bring in more product in anticipation of uh, hitting tariffs. John's dead on. Absolutely. Especially as, as it gets closer to the election and the polls start. If they are favoring Trump, yeah, you'll see companies do that. So, John and Brandon, you follow in after John on this, if you'd like. If Let's say I'm a... A shipper, I was at TPM, I'm expecting a Trump presidency, but I didn't really want to sign up to spot rates as they are right now because the carriers aren't giving me a deal I want. I've, I've done a three-month deal on my Trans-Pacific shipping, mostly from China into the US. What advice would you do if I want to tie in my rates a little bit later in the year for a 12-month period? Well, I, I think that really depends upon where the spot rates are. The spot rates came down quite a bit between... I think February 23rd and uh, the 1st of March, they dropped from 4,500 to 2,900 is where they sit at today, roughly. So right now the contract rates, everybody's looking at somewhere between 1,700 and 2,200. So they're not off by that, that much. And to the extent that they stay lower, there's no incentive to commit your full volume to a contract. So a, a lot of companies may go 50-50, carrier contracts and VOCC, which allows them to ride the spot rates. So I, I personally hope rates go up a bit because it's no good for anybody when rates get so low, carriers can't make money, forwarders can't make money. And, and that's not a good sign because what it does, it creates the potential for volatility as soon as the carriers have the opportunity to increase the rates. Yeah, I, admittedly, I haven't... <laughs> I don't engage in rate discussions with our members because our lawyers don't like me to do so. So I would just say that I would imagine many are just riding the market and seeing what happens. What's both of your views on what these potential tariffs or a more difficult relationship between US and China, what does this all mean in terms of this China plus one sourcing? Do we expect it all to accelerate over the next few years? Um, what does this mean for China's factories and the Chinese economy. You're over there all the time, John. Are people worried about this? Well, well, I call this China plus 10, not China plus one. I've got a company I do business with in Vietnam, and I was with the owner of that company. And, you know, Vietnam's exports are up 40%. I'm not saying to the U.S., but in general are up 40%. Mexico's become our number one trading partner. 
I think what you're seeing is a restructuring of where and how we get product. And all it means, I mean, we're not leaving China, we're bringing it closer. In 2010, my wife and I wrote a book that was distributed by the Journal of Commerce, Yangtze River World Report. And in it, we studied the infrastructure of China and the pillar industries that every city had. And what people don't realize when a factory moves, it's not a factory. And, and what Elon Musk was saying when he was encouraging all his suppliers to move, the Chinese set up a bonded logistics park and the factories have all their tier one suppliers there. They're doing that in Mexico as we speak. I think what you're going to see is trade between China and Mexico boom and trade between Mexico and the U.S. boom. And our product is just going to be diverted via China or Vietnam or South America or wherever people decide to set up factories. It's really the Chinese manufacturing companies that are moving. It's not like we're going to source from a new factory. I have a client that's an importer that's a very close friend. We have breakfast probably twice a month. And what he told me is, and he imports countertops for large projects, basically quartz. And Chinese basically own most of the capacity for that in places like Italy. And as he put it, he needed a Chinese factory manager in Vietnam because they know what they're doing more so than anybody else. What has happened is the Chinese have become the most sophisticated manufacturing country in the world. And everybody wants China to manufacture their product. I, I talked to one BCO at TPM that said he left and went to Mexico, then went back to China. It is very tough to leave China. We see that our members tell us the same thing. I mean, moving operations out of China after years and years of manufacturing there is not easy, but China is a step ahead of this, as John just explained. I had a member on the phone last night who said to me, you know, we're seeing full loads from China coming into Mexico. He told me that pricing on the TEU was, I think he said $15,000 out of China into, into Mexican ports. And I, I said, well, is that all cargo coming into the United States? Ultimately, is it being worked on in Mexico? He says, no, a lot of that is demand in Mexico. So Mexican consumers are actually looking for those products and maybe they're on forwarding to other places in South America. But the reality is, is that it's just what John said, the Chinese are one step ahead on this. And obviously they've had a lot of investment in Vietnam from China as well. A lot of those factories have moved over that border. You can avoid tariffs just by doing that. Yeah, they're investing all over. Look at their investments in South America and, and other places, you know, they're, they're way ahead. I'll just put a number on that. Um, uh, container shipping demand from China to Mexico increased by almost 60% in January 24 compared to January 2023. Now, some of that might be due to the change in the, when the Lunar New Year holidays were, but not all of it for sure. Now, if a lot of this trade, um, a lot of the US supply chains are becoming more dependent on Mexico, there's also a lot of political noise about that relationship with Mexico. Some of it to do with immigration, but not just immigration. It's also to do with trade. Trump has already said that if China starts building car plants in Mexico to sell in the US, then he'll put a 50% tariff on those cars. But isn't Mexico got to be part of a, a more resilient supply chain for US shippers, even if you're not totally reliant on it? You know, they play a crucial role in our economy, and that's not abating. But, you know, obviously there are customs procedures that need to be looked at. Infrastructure development is a big issue. And there's also something we can't overlook, and that's a security issue. There's a crime issue going on down in, in Mexico that needs to be addressed. And the Mexican government doesn't seem to have a, as good a handle on it as it should. And I think that that scares a lot of American buyers. I hear tales of forwarders and, and manufacturers when they go across the border, they have to have security teams with them. And, you know, we don't see that in many other countries throughout the world, but we see it in Mexico. And that's a big concern. You know, Brandon, I, I think what you're bringing up is a very interesting topic. I've thought about this a lot and I don't have an answer to it, but I, I think the movement of Chinese factories and bonded logistics companies in China, I, I am hopeful that that will change the dynamics of crime in, in uh, Mexico, because you're going to have this influence, this Chinese influence that is going to be, to a certain extent, a positive influence, because one, it's, it's bringing money to Mexico. Two, I'm hoping it'll overwhelm the criminal elements in Mexico, because they're not going to put up with what's going on with the criminal elements there. And I'm certain that the Chinese companies will have their own security forces. So I, I don't know how this is going to sort itself out, 
you know, I just came back from Mexico. And the one of the things I, I thought there, I, you know, you go into these large malls and you see all of these EV showrooms. I mean, you walk into a mall and if you see fewer than six or seven showrooms with these different cars, it's actually uh, quite odd. And the thing I noticed about them is I love them. Their colors, the design, everything they do is quite amazing. They're much more aggressive in terms of their design and, and what they're willing to build than we are in the U.S. And I think that's going to be an issue. Yeah, I, I think you're right, John. And I, I think once, you know, if legitimate manufacturing starts uh, being a, a primary source of income that's spread to the people and it beats revenue from drugs, from fentanyl and, and the scourge that we're seeing there, then I think that's absolutely right. We're going to see positive developments out there. Unfortunately, as long as you have drug cartels ruling the day in various regions, you're going to still have the security concern, and that scares the United States. You know, one of the things I was involved in with Transfar, which I found very interesting, was with the APM terminals, which is Maersk Line, down in Manzanillo. They were connecting me uh, with the Kansas City Southern before the CP bought them. And what I didn't realize until I was in a number of meetings with them is that when they run those trains, they're running a security force and cameras with those trains. So to, to a certain extent, when you look at particularly the CP now, the CPKC, whatever you want to call it, they've got a pretty secure movement of trains. My understanding or what they told me and what they gave me in presentations was because I was looking at connecting Transfar into Chicago via rail and into Houston via rail. And this is another avenue that we're going to find that grows. I was actually surprised that the UP or the BNSF did not purchase the Kansas City Southern. And I think it was a mistake because you're going to have the CP controlling another route into the U.S. that bypasses the east-west routes. I agree. I, I, I Personally, I was invited to, to ride along on the Kansas City Southern train at Laredo that went across the border, didn't have to change crews on that bridge. And they did a signing ceremony over in Nuevo Laredo, you know, across the, the border there. As we rolled into Mexico, every street was blocked off by military Humvees with machine gunners at every single block. And when we rolled into the station in Mexico, there was a security force, the likes of which probably rivaled what they used to protect the president of the United States in order just to sign the contract we all shook hands and everyone got back on the train, went back into the United States. And I, the lasting memory for me is these guys have a security problem. It needs to be taken care of pretty quickly. Yeah, that sounds very similar to my trip to uh, Hezbollah's territory in the, on the Syrian border of Lebanon in the summer, actually. <laughs> it's probably very similar. <laughs> similar sort of security issues there. <laughs> but that's a, de a slightly different story. We're in this more fragmented world. The Biden administration has been accused of protectionism. China's been accused of protectionism over the, the last few years. Europe's constantly accused of protectionism. Are these things to be overcome, or is this just where the world's going? Is the next stage of globalization, does it look more like a, a regionalization of global trade or mercantilism? You know, it's, it's sad because I think Brandon, you, myself, Mike, we've ridden the back of the China dragon to prosperity, and I think the world has. And if you think back, you know, when I first came into this industry and what's happened, We've had peace for the most part. I mean, we haven't had all of these kinds of issues. And, and that's what global trade has brought us. And what we're seeing now is an alignment of different accesses that, that bring friction and disruptions to the possibility of prosperity. I mean, for the first time ever, I worry about late in life, I have a 12-year-old son. I worry about his future. So it's something that I never thought about before. Where are we going? We have all these trade agreements that are bilateral trade agreements. And so where does that take us with China? It's too early to tell, but I don't think it's good. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, I'm really for free trade, but it's got to be fair trade. Yes. And that's essential. I think that there have been some abuses in some of the uh, trading that we've seen with other countries. But generally speaking, there's an overarching benefit for, for global trade, uh, regionalization, protectionism, are dead ends. And the reality is, is it's funny, you're in the United States, you hear this narrative of 
oh, we got to make everything here in the U.S. And and a lot of times that ship has sailed. We just don't have the furniture industry as an example that we used to have in the Carolinas. It's being made over in, in China. The, the reality is the same people who preach that narrative then run into Walmart to do their shopping and don't realize that these goods are coming from other places. We don't manufacture them here and we probably will never do so again. So we have to figure out a way to iron out these differences. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brandon. I think what we're seeing is, for the most part, the furniture industry has moved to Vietnam, and that's a big mover of furniture. But right now, the furniture industry is, is predominantly dead for all intents and purposes. I mean, we don't see a lot of furniture moving the way we used to. So a lot of companies that depended upon furniture, particularly some of the forwarders that depended upon furniture, you know, they're, they're struggling. Yep. Is this idea of, you said the free trade has got to be fair trade. I think I totally agree with you over the course of my career that the globalization and free trade has, has lifted people out of poverty and you know increased prosperity around the world. But I did read something really quite interesting. It's from one of the foremost proponents of that view of trade and globalization. And it, it's Angus Dayton, who's published on the IMF website, actually, if anyone wants to find it. He's a professor mm -hmm. at Princeton, and he was the... 2015 recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. So this is, he's one of the top economists in the world. And he wrote, I am now much more skeptical of the benefits of free trade to American workers. And I'm even skeptical of the claim, which I and others have made in the past, that globalization was responsible for the vast reduction in global poverty over the past 30 years. I also no longer defend the idea that the harm done to working Americans by globalization was a reasonable price to pay for global poverty reduction because workers in America are so much better off than the global poor. And I read that and I was like, this guy, he's just repudiated his entire career, essentially, yes. and, his, and his own Nobel Prize. Could we be wrong? I would say that, you know, he has points, but I think we need to meet somewhere in the middle. The U.S. may not have been as quick to respond to the demands of the global trade bring, retraining as an example of workers, making their products more competitive in certain industries. But the reality is, is that, yeah, it has had some, some negative effects. But I think overall, as John just mentioned, we benefit. We benefit as a country and, and it, it's all of us do when we're trading with one another. Plus, the reality is it, it promotes peace. I mean, if everything is done right, so you're, you know, you have peaceful relations with other countries, you're not fighting with them. And hopefully that will be continue to be the case with China, although we've seen some concerns. But look at Russia as an example. We're not trading with them and there's hostility there and, and only the countries that are trading with them are friendly. It's, it's not good overall. So um, it's not a long-term path of success to be uh, regionalized and protectionist. I agree with Brandon. I don't, I don't think you can say that trade doesn't bring prosperity. I mean, you look at how China has lifted their middle class, 300 million people in China now. They've sent their children to the West. Uh, they've built factories. They've built businesses. It's not about just prosperity of the U.S., but prosperity of the world that allows them to buy things. This has been a very positive and, and what Brandon is saying is absolutely correct. It's, it's brought peace. When you have prosperity, you, you're, you're not so angry. You're, you, you don't want to disrupt. Right. When you don't have prosperity, when things get expensive, and I think that's what's happening in the U.S., and not just interest rates, but with the inflation, everything's becoming more expensive. That's going to be a problem. Maybe my answers in my final question, I want to pivot slightly. I, I see the the words collaboration and technology appear in a lot of conference programs. They're usually the solution to whatever the topic is, whether that's supply chain silos, the green transition, everything really. But given all the risk we've discussed today, are they really panaceas? Can technology and collaboration make the world a better place or are, or are we looking in the wrong place? Brandon, to you first, can air cargo supply chains work better with more collaboration and if so, does technology fit into this, I guess, is the question. Okay, so the answer generally is yes. Technology is an asset. It's a tool. It's not the be-all, end-all in our business. This is a people business. Uh, we need to use technology 
to the best extent possible. Automation is essential. And I'm going to point to a situation that we're dealing with now at the Air Forwarders Association. We are trying to work on truck congestion at the major airports. During the pandemic, we saw trucks in the air, in the cargo areas waiting seven to nine hours routinely. And we're still waiting two or three hours at a lot of airports. And one of the reasons that we, when we surveyed our members, and there are a lot of reasons for it, uh, not just one, was that we're not leveraging automation. We're not using automation for appointment settings and, and information. So truckers are pulling up in front of terminals and they're walking inside to see if their freight's available when that could be done via the use of automation and messaging. So we need to ins uh, instill that more and we need to be more collaborative, leveraging technology and doing it. The more we can do that, the more efficient we'll become and more successful we will be. John, any thoughts on collaboration and technology and shipping or supply chains? I mean, we've got still too many silos. No, um, well, two things. You know, as you mentioned, I have a SaaS platform and I just took a top 25 company uh, live in it last year from actually a, a top four forwarder. And what I do differently is everything goes into a single database and all of these stakeholders have access to it. So not only the factories, but a control tower in Shanghai, a control tower in the US, the import team, the carrier management team, the brokerage team, the finance team, the audit and the buyers. So when you collaborate in that way and have everybody on the same page and the same data, it, it's a game changer. Now, that said, for that to happen, it's not just a matter of, of having a system. It's a matter of a company's got to be prepared to do it. They've got to make commitments that they probably don't think they need to make. In other words, a lot of people are out there selling systems that they think they've got the best system, but it doesn't match the importer's business process. And therefore, when they try to put it together, they don't get all the data. Where silos are concerned and you know, I just came back from PPM. They have a lot of booths. You have all these different tech companies that specialize in one thing or another, whether it's aggregating data or, or raids or, you know, what event milestones, uh, marketplaces. And I've never believed in the marketplace model, but nevertheless, until it all comes together in an end to end solution. So for me, I can't do it by myself. I, I count on project 44 to populate my data. You know, I, I have my own team and the stakeholders are involved in, in setting the rules. So it's a more complicated process than people realize. And it takes a lot more work than people realize. And it's even further complicated by the cybersecurity issues and ransomware attacks that we're seeing now that obviously we need to get a handle on long term. That's like the modern day trade robbery. I mean, yes. what's going on there and governments are stepping up to the plate, but we need to get a handle on that to find success. So cyber cartels, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, they exist. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. probably exist. Maybe not Mexico, but over in other places like Russia and areas. I, like I'm that. so tempted to go into cybersecurity and geopolitics here, but I think we've covered that enough. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a little more collaboration and less hostility from our politicians around the world? Maybe they just need some new technology to bring them together. I live in hope. Uh, to be returned to in future episodes, but for now, John Monroe, President of John Monroe Consulting, and Brandon Freed, Executive Director of the Air Forwarders Association. Thanks for joining me today on the Freight Buyers Club. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Freight Buyers Club, produced in partnership with the DeMurco Express Group. Please subscribe and follow on your platform of choice or sign up for delivery to your inbox at thefreightbuyersclub.com. This podcast wouldn't have been possible without the fantastic editing of Karen Ball and Tom Matthews. And finally, thank you all for listening. The next episode will be with you soon.